welcome back to Beginner's Fab. My name is Eric McGrew, and of course, I'm the host of the show. Um, today, I'm going to be showing you a little bit about what I'm doing on the Forerunner behind me. It has a bit of rust, and I'm having to replace a body mount bracket gusset. Yes, that is a lot to say, but that's what it is. So, where the body and the um, where the body bolts to the chassis, that bracket has a gusset and it's all rusted out so let me show you what I'm talking about let's see if you can actually see up in here so there you go that is the body mount on that's welded onto the chassis as you can see and the body bolts through some bushings onto that mount now as you can tell I've already started cutting out and things but here that's what is left and that's what was that body mount gusset. Here's what the body mount gusset on the other side of the truck looks like. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it should have looked like. And then you, of course, you saw what it actually looked like. So on this, I'm having to do a number of things because, well, first off, we're not just dealing with a replacement of something that broke. We're dealing with a rusted out piece, which means that you have to take two factors into consideration. First, you need to make sure that all of the rusted pieces are out if you can. Second, you need to make sure that what you're going to weld to is not rusted. It's actually, actually solid. Third, you need to make sure you clean it really well. Anything that has to do with the chassis is a bit of a challenge because you have all of the undercoat going on. And that undercoating is a real challenge to get off sometimes. Now, I'm using a wire wheel to kind of wheel it out and I'm using a hand brush and things. One benefit and one negative that are kind of hand in hand are that since it's rusted, the body um, undercoat or the chassis undercoat is flaking off fairly easy. The problem is what's left under the undercoat is a lot of rust. And while I can't get the wire wheel all the way up in there like I'd like, I can do it with a hand brush. and. It's working, but it does take more time, so keep that in mind. Be patient, get it clean, and then make sure you weld it in. The thing is that this is the only stock I have around at the moment. It's two inch angle, it's architectural. It has the um, really thick radius right here to give it even more strength. And on top of that, it's 3 16 Now the original were pieces that were mounted into this um, piece or you know this bracket as a gusset were only like eighth inch so they weren't nearly this thick I'm just using this because this is what I have so do you need to go 3 16 no you don't it just needs something to keep those walls from flaring out on that gusset the likelihood is you could probably run like it is and never have any issue but if you hit a big impact or if somebody hits you or if you have a lot of weight in the rear and it hits the bump slops real hard, there is a possibility that you could flare those out, especially in that rear corner. So because of that, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut a chunk out of this, not a whole angle, just cut like a rectangle across the long part of the flat on one side and then off and make basically a small piece of flat bar. If you have flat bar, you could use that. Or if you have sheet metal, you could cut a rectangle out of that and put it in there as well. You can see where I've already made the vertical cut on this. Now I'm gonna make the horizontal to meet with it and that'll be the rectangle that I use. You can actually probably see, maybe, just maybe, you can see the line that I have scored on there with a screwdriver since I don't have any marking tools to make this line that I need to cut. So I have this uh, piece cut out here that I need for the gusset. As you can see, it has a little bit of an indention there and the corners are cut. This is to replace what the factory had as holes drilled in it for the water drain. The reason I decided to do it this way is because the holes they had drilled were drilled up higher, about a quarter of an inch. So you had to have all that water actually sit in there before it could get up to the level to drain out. Whereas I hope with these cuts on the corners and in the center there, when I weld it in, there will be a gap in the water and hopefully the mud and stuff will just fall right on out. You can see how I cut the angle. I, as I mentioned, I just cut a slice out of it to make kind of a flat bar or whatnot, and that was my goal. And then this is what I used. I actually found that you had to taper the sides a little bit because that's how the gusset is. I don't know if it got flexed or 
you know, um, a little bowed inward or if that's just how it was from the factory. But I'm gonna weld it in that way and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, it'll just keep it where it's at and it won't go either outward nor inward. You guys aren't up to speed on, on how or what I'm using to do this. I'm gonna show you here what I've got. I'm welding with the Hobart 210 MVP and I use a Lincoln Viking 3350 large view helmet and it's auto it's auto darkening so that's um what you need to know I am using gas I'm using gas mig not flux core so I have it all running I'm using 7525 which is 75 argon and 25 carbon dioxide sorry not monoxide dioxide but there you go with that. Because I'm in an open area, I am running at around 35 CFM for the, uh, the gas so that I make sure that I have good flow. I'm in a garage, as you can tell, so there's no real direct wind. There's just a light breeze, so I still run at around 35, 40 CFM. If I was outdoors, you'd want to run over 45 is what I was told. So keep that in mind. And here on the front, these machines, I'm still trying to get used to this because you don't actually have volts um, settings as to how many volts you're using. It just says volts and then it has one through seven. That can be a little bit complicated. I, I don't really know how to judge those yet. I'm still using the chart that's on the side. I am still using the chart that comes on the side right here. I'm not ashamed to say it. It's not like using the measurements that you normally would. So for today, I am doing steel. I am doing carbon um, and argon. I'm doing 115 because that's all I have here. And I'm going to go over to the 3 sixteenths. And it technically says there's nothing there. That's why I ground a bevel into it. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to do a 7. And since I'm using 030 wire, I'm going to do a 30 wire speed. I'll probably end up putting it at around 35, maybe even 40 wire speed for this and see how it works and then go from there. Also, a good thing to keep in mind is since the gussets or the, I'm sorry, the brackets themselves are made out of a much thinner material, I'm going to be actually welding onto the 3 16 plate and dragging it over into the thinner material to help it bind in so that it's not actually burning out the other material. So that's what I'm going to do now and then I'll show you a little bit after I've gotten it tacked into place. Well I actually got the piece welded in and the welds didn't turn out exactly like I had wanted because <clears throat> a number of factors. One is that I'm welding on a 115 volt or uh yeah 115 volt plug um that does make a difference it's a little bit harder and the other is that the material that i was trying to weld in was so thick um by the standard of what uh hobart says one eighth should be the thickest and i'm doing three sixteenths to one eight so between trying to meld it from one three sixteenths to one eight it's still quite a bit of heat it has to produce and it's struggling to do that on its own, and then you put it in an overhead out of position weld where you, normally you would turn up your volts even more, we're maxed out, and so I couldn't uh, do that. I did get a little bit better of a weld, and sorry, sorry, I, I forgot to take a photo or video before I ground it all down because what I'm trying to do with the grinding all this is I'm trying to make it as smooth as possible so that water and stuff won't stick on there and rust around the welds if possible. Plus I'm going to paint it with bed liner. So that was my idea. I just forgot to take a video before I did any of that grinding. And what happened is on this side over here, I actually preheated this side and that, and it actually had a better looking bead. However, it didn't still turn out like I wanted. It was a, it, it wasn't, disconnected and it wasn't droopy with globs but it was hanging a little bit more than normal because it's upside down and it's out of position what like I said you'd need more um, power usually more voltage to, to push it up in there real good and, and cut into it um, 
Is it a great penetrating weld? Honestly, no. You can see that on this side, it got a little bit of pinholing. But is it going to hold this bracket in place? Probably. If it doesn't, I'll find a 230 volt connection and then I'll weld it up nice and strong at that point. In the meantime, I'm going to leave it like this. And if I have any issues, I'll show you guys the repair in the future. It is, folks. I'm going to put another coat that's textured on it, but that's the plate that got welded in and it's going to hold good enough for what I need it to in this. Um, understand that with those pinholes that you saw on the left hand side, I, I'm not a fan of leaving pinholes. Um, in this case, it's not going to be life threatening or anything. If it had been something super important structurally, I would have ground those out and probably preheated with the torch that I have. I'm just using a map gas torch, which doesn't get it as hot as I'd like. But I would have um, preheated and then re-welded in that way, trying to get a better flow. And also making sure that my nozzle was cleared because it got a little clogged up in the overhead position. So um, that's just a couple of things you need to kind of think of with that stuff. And understand that the welding you do on 115 volt is highly different than welding with 230. And fact until I guess two days ago four days ago four days ago I had never even welded MIG or stick on 115 I don't even know if they make a stick welder that does 115 input um, so this is all new and because of the suspension that I've been doing on the truck and the timing belt we've been doing and that kind of stuff I haven't had time to really play with this welder so I'm kind of setting it on their settings and trying to go with it and I gotta say if it says max on the machine, it seems like that's the worst case scenario. I wouldn't suggest really counting on that. Whatever their max is, I would consider the, the thickness under their max, like this one says 3 eighths for 230 volt. I would consider probably 3 sixteenths being um, your max that you could weld efficiently with it. So keep that in mind. Uh, I don't know, I'll have to try it on, I'll have to try it on 230. I know that I use the Miller 211 at um, Tactical Armor Group, the, the bumper company, and they had it on a 230 volt, and they also ran it, um, and it, it seemed to weld just fine 3 sixteenths. The thing is, is that they were also running a different gas mix. They were running 98% argon and 2% carbon dioxide. So, um, does that make a difference? Yeah, it does. I've been told that that burns hotter. I don't know. So I'm going to do a little bit more investigating with that kind of stuff too. Um, and then I'll let you guys know what I find out. And I'm going to keep practicing with this thing to kind of get a better feel of how it works. Guys, that's all I've got for you today. Um, this is one of many episodes that I'm putting out. I'm, I'm trying to build up a bunch of stuff. I've got a bunch of tool reviews to come up soon. Um, I've got projects over on the ORDIP videos that I'm doing on the Forerunner as well. I'm about to install a bumper that I actually helped make um, over at TAG. It was part of payment for work there. And then I am also um, putting up videos on the suspension if you haven't already seen those. And um, other stuff that I do along the way, I'll be putting up that info as well. Also, don't forget to check out offroadindependence.com. That's in my other site. You can get to beginnersfab.com, the website itself, for articles that I've written and stuff like that through beginnersfab.com or brgfab.com, either one. And then also, please for, don't forget to check out zazzle.com forward slash offroad, all one word, underscore independence. And check out the shirts that I've got for BGR Fab and for Off-Road Independence. You can get stickers, mugs, a bunch of different stuff over there. Hoodies, whatever you want. So go check that out, please. And, and that'll help support me as well. And then, of course, there's just the podcast that I've got going on. Um, I did, I'm, I'm just putting up episodes when I can. And I'm actually starting to put up backlogged episodes. Episodes that I did originally. And that have been taken off the internet when I um, started putting them only on YouTube. So those will be popping up, so check that out as well. And of course, don't forget, I'm also offering bumper kits. You can buy a, a kit and weld it together at home and have your own bumper made. And all you have to do is fit the pieces together, follow the dimensions that are provided, and then you put it on your truck. 
So it takes the guesswork out of it and allows you still to build your own bumper. If you're interested in that, don't forget to communicate with me through social media. You can get uh, send me private messages or you can just directly email me at Eric Jim Andes, E R I C J E M A N D E S at gmail.com. And all of this is in the comment or in the uh, description below. So you can find all those links there. Thanks guys for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.